OpenSea Marketplace receives a Wells notice from the SEC. A letter from the SEC saying that we're going to sue you pretty soon. Look out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's been some criticisms of the Ethereum Foundation and some questions around where they've been putting their money in recent years. I'm Maxwell, the creative director at Cointelegraph. And I'm Gareth Jenkinson, the managing editor of Cointelegraph. And today we're going to be breaking down the biggest stories from last week. Telegram CEO Pavel Durov was arrested, charged, and then released to stay in France on various charges uh, for his Telegram app. Tell us what happened here, Gareth, and give us a breakdown. Yeah, this was definitely the biggest story of last week, and it dominated our coverage. The TLDR here is that Durov was detained last Saturday after landing in Paris. Uh, he appeared in court on Wednesday, and he was indicted with six charges related to various illicit activities that are alleged to have happened on Telegram. These include uh, the application being used for child sexual abuse material and drug trafficking, and that Telegram had refused to share information or documents with investigators where it was required by law in France. He was released from custody on a 5 million euro bail, and he is now forbidden from leaving France, and he's going to have to check in at police stations twice a week. French President Emmanuel Macron also squashed rumors that he had personally invited Jurov to Paris for dinner the night that he was arrested. Uh, speaking during a visit to Serbia, Macron said he wasn't even aware that Jurov was traveling to the country. Meanwhile, a Financial Times report published over the weekend cites financial statements that show that Telegram held around $400 million in cryptocurrency at the end of 2023. That also notes that Telegram posted an operating loss of $108 million last year, despite generating $342 million in revenue. Apparently, 40% of Telegram's revenues came from digital asset-related activities under the categories Integrated Wallet and Sale of Collectibles. Meanwhile, the Ton blockchain ecosystem achieved some interesting metrics in the wake of Jurov's detention and release. Ton surpassed 1.1 million daily active users and reached a market capitalization of $3.96 billion just two days after Jurov was arrested. OpenSea Marketplace receives a Wells notice from the SEC. Gareth, what is a Wells notice and what does this mean? I thought the SEC, I mean, they've been hammering crypto for a while, but I thought it maybe, you know, stepped off. What's going on here? Yeah, I think everyone thought it was kind of uh, stepping off a little bit, uh, heading into the elections. OpenSea received a Wells notice from the SEC, and essentially what this is, is a letter from the SEC saying that we're going to sue you pretty soon. <laughs> so uh, their CEO, yeah, exactly. Their CEO, Devin Finza, tweeted that they had received this Wells notice. And obviously, it's really bad news. They're accused of offering unregistered securities in the form of NFTs. Finza says that by targeting NFTs, the SEC is putting hundreds of artists and creatives at risk. And many of these people don't actually have the resources to defend themselves. OpenSea have pledged to donate up to $5 million to help any creators or developers that are targeted by the SEC as a result of this impending lawsuit. It's really bad news for the NFT sector in, in general. Um, up until this point, they hadn't really been targeted. We'd seen many big cryptocurrency exchanges in the US targeted by the SEC last year, Coinbase and Binance. Uh, alleged to have offered unregistered securities and now major nft platforms are catching heat from the sec in the united states so it's it's not great news for for the sector um, and we do hope that they get ample support OpenSea have said that they're going to fight this in court so it's a very similar take to the likes of consensus and many ethereum ecosystem participants that have been in the, the crosshairs of the sec and said that they're going to fight it in court as well so the ecosystem is definitely pushing back, and it is surprising to me so close to the elections that uh, the SEC is still um, on this sort of path of uh, no return. Vitalik Buterin breaks down the 2023 Ethereum Foundation expenditures. So basically, the Ethereum Foundation is just this massive organization with you know, ample money. Uh, they've been pushing through many technological developments when it comes to L1s, L2s, you know, ZK. There's more transparency now. Uh, tell us what did we learn from Vitalik Buterin's post and uh, yeah. what does it say? There's been some criticisms of the Ethereum Foundation and some questions around where they've been putting their money in recent years. They've released a breakdown of their expenditure from last year. Uh, Vitalik Buterin weighed in here and uh, very, very interestingly, the breakdown shows that about 36% of their expenses last year went to new organizations and entities. And then about 25% went to layer one research and development. 
Now, I can tell you that Josh Stark, one of their uh, the Ethereum Foundation spokespeople, uh, broke down this category for new uh, institutions. And this includes the likes of Nomic Foundation, Decentralization Research Center, L2Beat, and some other related organizations that received significant funding last year. So this is where the Ethereum Foundation was putting their money. Obviously, people are asking questions just considering uh, the amount of money and the amount of support that they give to the Ethereum ecosystem in general. And one take from me that I found very interesting was that L2 R&D only got about 1.4% of the expenses last year when the Ethereum ecosystem very publicly said that it was going to be moving to an L2 centric approach using layer two protocols to really drive the scaling of Ethereum into the future. But they only received just over 1% of the expenses, which is uh, really interesting to see. We're going to have, probably have to wait until next year to see where the money went this year. And I would probably wager that a lot more money went to L2s in 2024. But we'll have to wait and see. Celsius has distributed $2.5 billion to around 250,000 of its creditors uh, amid its bankruptcy proceedings. Tell us about this, Gareth, what does it mean? Uh, we're seeing, you know, kind of like some of this clawback, but what does that mean for the investors uh, into Celsius and, and, you know, for maybe kind of the wider, broader industry as we have bankruptcy proceedings going on, uh, you know, across the board? Yeah, for me, this is positive news for anyone involved in the cryptocurrency space because we're seeing a lot of these big collapsed institutions finally pay back creditors that lost out when they collapsed. You know, uh, the likes of Mt. Gox has finally turned around and started paying people back. And Celsius is part of that uh, big group of companies along uh, with the likes of FTX that collapsed a couple of years ago and they've gone through their bankruptcy proceedings. According to a court filing from last week, about $2.5 billion has been paid back to around 250,000 creditors. And this is about 84% of the $3 billion worth of assets that was owed to uh, the defunct crypto lender. What is interesting about the story is that the rest, you know, that's 16%, hasn't been claimed back by some users. And that's mainly because a lot of these users had $100 or less in Celsius, and they just haven't even gone to the effort to to claim back the money that they lost Gotta when the company went bank, bankrupt. You know, yeah, exactly. Check your emails. Uh, you know, a hundred dollars of Bitcoin could be worth a lot of money in a few years' exactly. time. <laughs> so, yeah, to me that was very interesting. And my general take on this is that it's a uh, it's it's good news for the industry. It shows that there really has been a lot of maturation, and that companies that have gone bankrupt have followed through with the legal proceedings and are actually making good on paying people back the money that they lost. Yeah. Is there a reason why, you know, we're, we're going through the Mt. Gox creditor distribution, which happened, you know, over 10 years ago, uh, or around 10 years ago, at the same time as Celsius, which happened around three years ago? Is it just because things are, you know, there are better systems, there are more regulations now, there's easier ways to claw back and do this kind of like financial investigations or or you know forensics, but do you have any insight on why it took so long for Mt. Gox, um, but were relatively quick for FTX for for Celsius? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have a concrete answer, but I would wager that the creditors to Celsius were a lot more well documented mm -hmm. than Mt. Gox, and there was probably a lot more complexity in identifying all the creditors uh, that needed to be paid back money when when Mt. Mt. Gox went bankrupt. That's been an ongoing case, like you said, for, for 10 years. And we're finally seeing all those all that Bitcoin being paid back, whereas Celsius you know, went bankrupt two years ago. And it was probably a lot easier to identify creditors because there were a lot of people crying for their money to come back. So that's, uh, that's my general take. Now to El Salvador. Nayib Bukele said that Bitcoin hasn't had the widespread adoption they had hoped for. Gareth, what's going on down in El Salvador? Yeah, this is a big story for me from last week. Nayib Bukele is on the latest cover of Time magazine, which is very interesting given that a lot of his critics call him an authoritarian. He has instituted a lot of change in El Salvador. Some of his methods have had some serious criticism. But uh, one of uh, the most redeeming and important parts of his regime has been the adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender. They did that back in 2021 and it grabbed headlines all around the world. He's been really honest in this interview about um, the widespread adoption of Bitcoin not being as good as they hoped in El Salvador. I've spoken to many people that have been there, a couple that actually live there right now. 
And these people also tell me a similar story that uh, Bitcoin adoption is not quite what they make it out to be. But that being said, uh, you can still use Bitcoin to pay for things like a Big, Big Mac in McDonald's in El Salvador or pay for groceries at a supermarket. So it is very much usable. How it's being used and how much it's being used is a different question altogether. The reason I put this story in this week was just the fact that uh, an individual like Nayib Bukele is on the cover of Time magazine, given that he does have some critics for his approaches. But another very important reason why I put this here was the fact that Bitcoin is being spoken about so openly in a very well-established, well-respected mainstream uh, news publication. And the fact that he's talking about Bitcoin so candidly is very important. You know, uh, its adoption might not be going as they had hoped, but they are the first nation in the world to adopt it as legal tender. Uh, they are a trailblazer of sorts. And uh, it's important to put the story out there that people can use Bitcoin in El Salvador and other countries could learn a thing or two from what they're doing down there. So I thought this one was important and just very interesting given that uh, a lot has happened in a few years time and we are already seeing Bitcoin being spoken about in the biggest uh, publications around the world. Definitely. El Salvador really put the currency back in cryptocurrency. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone. We'll see you again next week. Yep. Catch you next week.